I uh, was always uh, allured and fascinated by uh, other dimensions of time and space from a childhood. And I began, without much awareness, to find an entry into that other time and space through rituals. Uh, one of, the, if not the earliest childhood memory I had, uh, that I have actually, is a, of a ritual um, where I was crafting an altar to Jesus and Mary. We had a statue of them in our home and I climbed up on the little stool to put a piece of fabric, like a bed sheet or a tablecloth, underneath the statue so it would hold the cloth. And I cascaded the statue down in front of this um, dresser drawer. I got off the stool and I remember cutting up pieces of bread and I took the ends of the cloth that were on the floor and I began chanting and, um, and the bread would go up in front of these, the statues and I was chanting and chanting and chanting and, and I probably was chanting something noticeable that my father came and he um, took me away from that and said, stop it, what are you doing? Are you crazy? And I knew there was something there. I knew, as there's a wonderful book by Mirabar Star, and Mirabar Star has a wonderful translation of John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. And in the introduction to that dark night, she writes this beautiful uh, journey of awareness of another dimensionality to life and space, which we Christians certainly call God, a Trinitarian God of love. And John of the Cross would certainly portray that same beloved lover imagery of God. But in it she said that, that, uh, that, that we are to wonder if when we were very young the veil opened up and we saw something. And then for the rest of our lives, the rest of my life, from that moment even till now, there's a sense, a knowing that there is something. There is another dimension of time and space, another dimension to life. And that for me, that childhood moment around four years old was a, was a way in which the veil opened through a ritual. I mean, it was through the ritual activity that somehow I was either being called or was responding or both to something that was, was, um, was, uh, was mesmerizing, uh, enchanting, a dimension of time and space that a child could see. And that when my father pulled me away and said I was crazy, I, I really think that he was correct because there is a way in which the the, the, the looking for that veil to open again as we grow in age through a childhood and, and adolescence and young adulthood and middle age and, and being, an, being an elder of the community. That, that, the, that Mirabar Star is saying that, that we keep looking for this and then, and then the divine keeps wanting to reveal itself to us through other ways. And that ultimately, she says in the introduction to this book, that the ultimate ritual, if you would, or the ultimate um, way in which the divine is known, that this veil is re-entered, is not through the ritual action, but through the absence of any, through the, through the absence of any emotion or feeling or uh, uh, sense of, of presence of God, the, 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 that, that we enter through that dark night, it's called the dark night of the soul, through that becomes, if you would, God's ritualizing towards us and loving us in a way that we're not used to either being loved or comfortable with being loved, and therefore a form of craziness. 
it's a kind of madness. I was reading Alan Watts early, early on uh, as a teenager, a young kid, and I remember there was one line where he said, we use incense in our rituals. Uh, we use incense because we are realizing that we have to go out of sense. We have to, be, we have to go out of the senses and that the incense is a way out of the sense. It's a very, a very interesting little play on words that Watts was always used to doing. So that's how it started for me. It, it, and it continued then through, uh, as a child, through the various stages of uh, Roman Catholic ritual. As a kid, um, it was our pastor at the parish, Monsignor Anthony S. Spina. <laughs> he was a Monsignor, but he would always kind of humble himself because he said, but my name is Anthony S. Spina, and when you take my initials, it says ass, and he says, and I'm a dumb ass, he would say to us. And, uh, but he was a role model. He loved ritual. He engaged rituals beautifully. And the pastor, the associate pastor with him, Father John DiCaprio, both of whom are dead, and whom I summon every morning uh, into presence when I pray for the dead in the morning. I do the Kaddish, the Jewish prayers for the dead, but I do it Roman Catholic style. And I summon both of them in. I call upon them. Um, but both of them loved the rituals of the church. And I, as a child, you know, you're in that state of consciousness of the magic, mythical stage, you know, the enchanted stage. And it, it, it became an increase of what I had done at four years old. Now I was in this beautiful building and there were these magnificent sounds for the choir and the, and the Italian community in Schenectady, New York, where I grew up, cherished the musical dimension of the rituals. And then there were the, then, then there was these, then there were processions and then there were uh, devotions to the mother of God and to the saints and there were bones of the saints that were there. And this was a, uh, this was a wonderland for my imagination. And it just kept blooming and blooming. And these two priests, Father DiCaprio and Monsignor Spina, were just enlightened in the sense of their love for these rituals. And then the rituals moved from Latin into English when I was probably around, oh, I was maybe 10 years old, a little less. And they moved into the new language of English. So the veil of the, the, the mystical language of the Latin was removed. And it was bittersweet because there's something about the, the not knowing what the words are saying cognitively that allowed them to be opened quite experientially to the whole other dimensionality, that other space-time experience. So both Father DiCaprio and Monsignor Spina made the transition beautifully. They, 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 were, they did a beautiful passaggio into this other world of the English rituals without losing some of the majesty of the processions and the incense and the music and the uh, preaching that they, would off, that they would do that was highly poetic. Both of them were literary, uh, uh, you know, they were savants f f about of literature and poetry. So they were able to do this and I just ate it all up. And, and then my father and mother did not want me to go into the seminary. They did not want me to be a priest. They wanted me to be a lawyer. They said, with the, uh, they said, with the talent that you have of imagining things, you can argue any case and win any journey, jury over to your side. So I, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be one of those myth makers. I wanted to be one of those ritual makers. I wanted to, I wanted to be an enchanter, a shaman. I wanted to be a priest. And I, and I felt that somehow, and this is certainly not part of our tradition as the Roman Catholic, but somehow it was a very ancient predisposition of mine to be this kind of ritual maker, priest person. It was there. And I, was, and, I, and, I, and I fell into a family system that was part of a parish system, that was part of a church system, 
that kept nurturing this imagination until finally when I was graduated from public high school, because they wouldn't even send me to a Catholic high school. When I graduated from public high school, uh, I went to a seminary college, Siena College in upstate New York, for four years. And then everything began to shift. It could have been physiologically that my brain was, the brain was doing its final stages of growth. But I was introduced to, I had been reading Watts since a teenager, but all of a sudden I was becoming aware of what was being spoken in these words. When he, when he said, in a, it, was a, it was a July night when my family was sleeping and I was reading this book by Watts called um, Beyond Theology, The Art of Godsmanship. It's a lovely book. It's still in print, actually. And um, he, at the end of the book, he says, he uses a Buddhist frame of reference. And he says, we are God dreaming that we are not God. We are God dreaming. And I remember standing up from my seat at the kitchen table. Everyone was sleeping. This was probably 1 a.m. in the morning. And just going in front of the mirror and looking at the mirror. And it was this, and, and I had no idea of the Buddhist traditions of doing such practices. I just walked in and there it was. And then through my studies as a, as, as in Catholic theology, there was this magnificent paralleling going on of the mystical tradition where it, it moves from uh, c uh, uh, communion to union to identity with God. At that the indwelling of the Trinity is such that, you know, you hear Jesus say words like it's no longer, or St. Paul rather say words like it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, or St. Augustine saying those same experiences. It's like, um, it is that you, you, when we come to eat and drink the body and blood of Christ in these rituals, it is your own mystery. You become what you eat. You're Christ dead. And all of this mystical traditions that, that, that I was reading uh, in college and that kept coming up in philosophy classes. And then when I went to the University of Louvain in Belgium, because they sent me there, because the, bish the bishop said to me, you're a very good student. I was always a good student. He says, so you're going to choose where you want to go study for your major seminary studies. He said this. Do you want to go to Rome? And you'll be on the bishop track, <laughs> which I had no interest. He says, or you want to go to, I says, or do you want to go to Louvain or to l'Université Catholique in Paris? Then you'll be, on a, you'll be on a university track. I says, that's what I want to do. Because I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life savoring and understanding what it was that in childhood I saw that Mirabar star moment of the veil lifted and something was there. And even now as I age, seeking it in this, in this sense of absence and in the shadowy places of my own uh, dying. Not that I'm dying in the sense that I have any type of disease that I know of yet, but in the passing of the years, this is why I love teaching a course on death to the millennials. I'm teaching starting on Monday at DePaul University a course on death literature. And we're reading Harry Potter Volume 7, because <laughs> the Harry Potter novels are all about this mystical death, the mystical transformation and the enchantment of the magic of our world if we are trained with the eyes to see, even as muggles. <laughs>
uh, these wonderful words. Well, it seems to me that one of the dissatisfactions of the young generations, the millennials and the ones after them, is the dissatisfaction with institutions, religious institutions. And nevertheless, there's a desire for the transcendent, the, the experience, the mystical experience of love and of some depth, in-depth interiority and meaning. That's real. And so I give them poetry to read and things to read, to find language. Because Heidegger is correct here too, that language is the house of being. Yes. And the more language we have, the more rich consciousness can be. And I find that poetry is one way of doing it. I do that with my students at the... And there's a wonderful man named Walter Brueggemann. He talks about how we've become a world of flattened prose. Flattened prose. Memos, text messages, and tweets. Rather than the beauty of, of language that can come when you dwell, dwell, dwell in the beauty of language. And most recently, over the past three or four years, I've been working with them on interiority as part of the presiding style. In fact, they're going to read Integral Meditation by Ken Wilber, because I'm, there's no way that we can engage these rituals without some sort of interior life. And I was validated on that this summer. Validated. I was on a retreat this summer at a farm outside of Paris, La Ferme, with Jean Vanier. There's a community called L'Arche Communities. The L'Arche Communities are communities around the world that have been established for people with um, learning and developmental disabilities, emotional disabilities. Uh, Down syndrome was the word I believe we used previous. And Jean Vanier was a kind of like a St. Francis. He was a military man. He left the military dis, totally disengaged by war and violence. And um, he, um, he, he went on for a PhD in philosophy and psychology at La Sorbonne in France, where I might have gone. And, uh, and then he realized the suffering of people who were locked up in their homes because of this, of Down syndrome, this developmental disability, and they were locked up and put to shame, and, and in some cases even chained, and he saw that brutality in France. And he was inspired with a group of others to do something about it, and so he created these communities called L'Arche. I think the word L'Arche means bow, like a rainbow. And, um, and so he's 88 now, and he has communities all over the world. And that was the place we went for retreat. And so I, I presided at Eucharist there, and he came up to me and thanked me, and he said to me, I see Jesus inside you, which was very touching. I see Jesus. And so I, I asked to have an, a, a little talk with him, and he says, he was very sweet to me, very affirming. But then I asked him, if you were teaching young priests like I do, how to preside at Mass and how to preach. What would you want to make sure that they experienced and that they knew and, and, and knew deep down knowing? He thought a moment and he said, In interiority. And I nearly fell off my chair. He says, you cannot do any of what you do without some form of interior life. I get emails from my students after a session. Can I speak with you? And so that's the first opening, where there's an, an, an opening, not only interior, an, an interior awareness that I'm aware now that I haven't been aware, but I want to do something to explore that, or I don't understand what this is, help me, the first step is reaching out to someone and say, I want to talk. Which is another way of saying, if you were a Roman Catholic, 
he might ask to go to confession. Because that's, for, for a Catholic, a lingo like, I'd like to talk. And it's a safe, traditional way to ask a clergy to do that. But that means that there has to be a dis disposition of, on those with whom they speak of what, Holy, what Pope Francis talks about, accompaniment. Accompaniment. Kind of like in the Buddhist tradition where if a student of, a student of Buddhism or even in Hinduism as well, but certainly in, in Zen Buddhism, where they, they want to give themselves over to a teacher, a guru, and you surrender everything to that teacher. Uh, so that's the first step. I want to talk. And then on the part of the listener, namely me in this case, the first thing would be to tether my own desire to um, want to make it all good right away. Because this is a long journey, especially for a 19-year-old. I, 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 what, I what I do with these students that come to me and say, even in the classroom, huh? mm -hmm. but certainly the ones that see me later, because I'm, I'm mentoring, it's, it's, it's an accompaniment process. And I'm mentoring several different young people. But in the classroom, it's a form of mentoring. What I want them to do is explore what happened to them when they became aware that they were not being quite aware. So for me, it's not translating the mythic language of the past, the ancient images, but more talking about the experiences that they're having so as to um, accelerate another shift of consciousness by giving them maps. So, so, for instance, in the death class, we take a look at consciousness. Because one of the questions in the death experience is, what is consciousness? And does consciousness survive after the biological death? And so what we do is we explore ways in which psychology and psychological studies, for instance, are teaching us about the human capacity to become conscious. So we talk about consciousness. And I do exercises having them experience. I said, now come on, I want you to become consciously conscious. What are you becoming conscious of as you become conscious of your consciousness? So we do those exercises in class. So I'm, I'm working with these students and these students, the millennials that I'm finding, and this is uh, why I took the university track, because I knew that the real power of this religious tradition, see, the real power is not in the institutionalization of all of this. The real power is still in the rituals. It's still in the prayer traditions. It's still in the mystical traditions. It's still in the lives of the saints and the martyrs who engage us into a a longing for God as a long and extended preparation for death so that even while we're alive, I say to my students, and this is going to be there, they, 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 I, I have them memorize little parables that I've made up. So one of them is that the life journey through, its, through, its, um, through all of the experiences, the heartbreak, the romance, the disappointment, the sickness, the weakness, the successes, the births, the joys, the ecstasies, all of them are really, as Socrates even said, one long preparation for dying. And Christianity has as its centerpiece the, the death of the Lord. We say at, the, at, at our services, our rituals, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death. It's a long extended dying, and here's the, here's the parable I ask them to memorize, a little proverb. Die before you die, so that when you die, there's not much left of you to die, and then you can truly live until they bury you or cremate you. <laughs> and I have them memorize that. And, uh, and, and, and slowly these young students, which I have the pleasure of teaching, 
are understanding this because they're dying psychological deaths, many of them. A lot of their friends commit suicide or are on the verge of suicide. There's a lot of pain, but pain, and this is why I love teaching this, it's an opportunity without religious jargon and to help them understand that the human mechanisms of pain can become portals like those moments of entry and the veil can lift in those moments. But somehow, it, it, the, the students, and this is why I, I work with them on the interior life, uh, we practice some sort of, of, of quiet breathing to teach them a tradition that's not only in the Eastern religions, but in Christianity. We have the Jesus prayer, we have the contemplative Carmelites prayer, we have interiority, and without interiority, we do end up creating the idolatry of settling for life without enchantment. And, and, and so that's why when the bishop asked me, where do you want to go to school? I said, I'd like to go to Louvain so I could become a, a professor, teacher, a teacher of these rituals, but more than the rituals, teacher of how these rituals unveil or are portals to this mystery of the mystery of, of, of a divine communion with the beloved that enravishes us. Like John Donne, you know John Donne in the Holy Sonnet number five, I believe, he says, for I neither holy nor chaste will be unless, O oh God, you ravish me. That great line. So this is part of this. Uh, yes, sir. This is part of that reason I became a teacher, yes, to engage sir. them in that exploration of themselves. Because it's all here, you know. And even these bells, these bells um, that are ringing now from the bell tower of this church are a public declaration of the passing of time. And I spent uh, 10 days with Thich Nhat Hanh on a retreat with Martha Howard. She invited me to go on a Buddhist retreat at the seminary up in Mundelein in Illinois here. Up in Mundelein. <laughs> and we're 10 days in silence, eating in silence, listening to Dharma talks by, by, the, the, by the, the teacher every, every day, twice a day. And we meditated for hours. Hours. And, uh, and it was a wonderful beginning for me to become aware of the fact that the interior life is what is essential for any legitimate ritual to come alive. If you want to follow Christ, the big fish, learn to drown. Not just surrender a little. That means to let the water take care of you. But this is a deeper step. It is allowing the water to drown us, to kill us. To breathe under the water means to breathe death. It means to live in an alternative way of life. It is a new mode of surviving breathing water instead of air. Now death is the mode of survival. Drown. This is the baptismal imperative. There must come within us a dispossession of the self. The extraordinary experience of dying must become the ordinary experience of living. The quote just read was certainly a way into understanding St. Paul who says that when you were baptized, you, you were buried with Christ and you were buried into his death. And I really do think that this buried into the death of Christ is the buried into dying to what Jesus says, if you want to find yourself, you got to lose yourself. It's, that, it's the self you got to lose that dies. And the self you got to lose that dies ain't the self that you think you are when you think of who you think you are. <laughs> that's, the, that's simply the conscious egoic self, the ego self that we have. But when 
Phil becomes aware that he's aware. He's aware there's something else besides the ego self in Phil. He realizes there's something else. He becomes consciously conscious. And I, I think that what that passage is suggesting is that that is really a transformation of consciousness. It's actually a new state of being conscious. You're no longer conscious simply from this egoic, egocentric place. Consciousness expands and you find that you're conscious now of something, of, you're conscious that I am more than simply my thoughts. I am more than my memories. I am more than my history. I am something, there's something else going on in consciousness than simply what I thought was going on or what I wasn't paying attention to what was happening. Something else is happening here, right? That's why I get this. So I think this is the mystical death that that passage was speaking of, the mystical death to the point where Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives. And if Christ is living in me, then who's living? Huh. Because then, if Christ is living in me, who's living, then who dies? Because maybe what I think survives after death is simply, this, is simply the self that's got to die before I die. <laughs> so that when I die, there's not much left of this who I think I am dying, and it is Christ then who lives. The great Christ, the, the godly Christ, the, the Christ who is the the Christ who is the Trinitarian, the Son of God, the Christ who is the godly, the godly communion. The Greeks call it the perichoesis, the dance, the dancing God that Nietzsche could only believe in, you know, the dancing God. But this is, but it's, it's a healing death. It's the dying death. It's the spiritual death. It's the mystical death. It's the psychological death. So that we then can live as if we were dead. And that's really living. I mean, Heidegger says this, you know, that we're beings unto death. And that authentic human living is when we acknowledge that there is a mortal coil that we're part of. We are. But then there is this other dimension to all of this, which is identity with the beloved. Not just, not just communion, but you become one with the beloved. And there's no longer I and you. There's just I so that God becomes the eye of my eye. This is, this is experiential. And see, this is the reality of interiority. This is not simply a matter of memorizing catechism books or ritual activities. It's not simply knowing the words. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's engaging in the human experience of life with all of its vulnerability. Being willing then, and this is the alternative life. The alternative life then is I re-enter into the relationships, into the love relationships, profound, vulnerable relations with the, where, where people are, uh, lay themselves bare in front of another. The, the, the experiences of sickness and mortality. The struggles of being betrayed, the human experiences of, of being betrayed or of, of, of not knowing where one is, like so many of these young people, on the verge of suicide because of the meaninglessness of things. The, lonely, the loneliness that's now pandemic. Um, many writers are wanting to tackle that today. Ken Wilber, certainly, I'm reading the book now, The Future of Religion. And what he's doing is wanting to say, you know, we're living in a world where the transcendent element of, the, of life is being quickly desiccated by the, uh, by the distractions of this, he calls it, the, uh, in another book, the Atman Project, you know. It's being desiccated. And, and so he says that there are, he says that, and I agree, that the, the process of this kind of dispossession
as, 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 as many pronged. And first is that desire, that curiosity, the eros, the eros that somehow there is more to me than what I think I'm already thinking I am. You know, a, a conscious consciousness, then a critical consciousness, a cosmic critical conscious consciousness, a, you know, a, you know, cosmic, the transcendent. When consciousness expands into this Christ consciousness, you transcend the egoic. Even if this is just a function of the brain, this is part of the, the dilemma these students at, at DePaul face, even if this is simply the potential of the human organism and the neurons firing that create this sensibility of something greater than simply the egoic consciousness, even if that's that only. And personally, I, 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 I tend not to believe that that's the case. I tend to believe that something else is functioning here. And this is where traditional Roman Catholic theology is, 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 you know, waxes eloquently. That the human is a, is, is the, is a, is a body-soul communion, a communion of the material and the spiritual. And so, yes, there is the way in which the body and the soul are intermeshed, and yet, can you distinguish them as we do our neurological studies of brain chemistry and, and, and all of that? That's, that's a real good question for me. But I think one of the ways in which we come to that place of dispossession is A, one, is through a, a, practice, a practice that will alter consciousness itself. And there's, there's nothing that parallels the question of silence and the question of the, of the, of the meditation or the contemplative practices. Across the board, there's nothing that we have as humans as simple as watching the breath, as simple as the Jesus prayer, as simple as simply allowing ourselves to sit in silence and watch the thoughts pass. It has to be a practice. So I teach the students at DePaul, we, we actually do a practice of that. That's one. Another one is that once you do that, you realize that there is more to consciousness than just that which is transcending consciousness. There's also subconsciousness that's got to get cleaned up. And so a second part, B, for me would be some serious devo uh, commitment to self-analysis, the, the, the unconscious, the subconscious stuff, sweeping that up. So I personally find myself being relishing the time that I spend in an analysis. I work with a Jungian anal analyst right now. And it was the first time I've ever done it for the past three years now. That's the first time. His question was, why did it take so long? Because <laughs> I thought I was quite sufficient doing it myself, but you can't. Because that's the third. The third one, you can't do this alone. Uh, this is a communal activity. This is something, and Jesus in the Gospel on Sunday will say, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. You need, this is a relational thing. It's done in relationality. And this is, this is unfortunate because when egoic consciousnesses relate, there's not really relationality. There's simply some form of of, you know, of locution, I suppose, speaking, but no vulnerable intimacies. And that's it. It's ultimately intimacy with... <laughs> you become intimate with yourself. Kierkegaard says, if you begin loving and you stop loving, you were never loving to begin with. Unlike the fact that you had a million dollars and you were a millionaire, that is true. But if you stop loving, once you start loving, if you stop it, you were never loving to begin with. He suffered a lot, Kierkegaard. It's like that kid, Phil, who comes in and says, I'm now becoming aware that I'm not aware. Something happens. You have an experience of something so different 
that you say, oh my God, this is something different. This is not quite the same. And that, and that moment of difference is awakening to something else. And there's a peace. There, 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 there seems to be, seems to be with, with these experiences, these deep experiences of deep intimacy or a deep communion or deep, there's usually some, there are usually some universal um, Characteristics. Peace is one of them. Uh, naturally, one becomes disinterested. I mean, you become uh, your ego no longer is very interested in grabbing. It's it's uh, there's a there's a sense of grasp non graspingness that's there. I, I mean, so I only can talk around this because it's you can't talk about something that, that it's an experience that that when you see it, you know it. You feel it, and it does change. Um, and that's where I think the deep conversations I I is something I, I find my students when they come and speak with me, they say things like, I don't talk like this with anyone else. And I'm not sure what that, if that's a compliment or a uh, fear. Because for some, to speak that deep or to share the longing is very frightening. And I think the deep silence is too. Because it's a vulnerability there to the point where we have no more moorings of the, of, of the familiar. And boy, do I, as I'm even saying this, I can feel my wanting the familiar to be familiar. It's the battle of, the, of wanting to just be in control. And the deep silence and the deep longing and the deep conversation, the deep speaking, ultimately ends up in a silence silence. And one author once said, it ends up in a silence, a wordlessness, a thoughtlessness, a consciousnessness, and a laughter that we ever had to talk about it to begin with. <laughs> but it is transforming, and I'm finding more people looking for this because they're, they're wanting, they're, they're so much, there's so much pain. So it's the paradox of the oneness and the threeness, which is this wonderful sense of, of, of I, I think you get that in human relations. I think the closest we get that is into relationships that are committed covenantal relations, where people in those relations say, I I no longer live for myself, but for you. Let me just say this. For Christians, therefore, the love experience is what God is. We say God is love. But the word is agapic, agape. And we see these, the words, the covenantal words, and you see them paradigmatically in the marriage vow. Huh? For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Basically what it means is the covenanting experience of love is, no matter what happens, I say yes to you. Yes. No matter what happens, my ego will no longer be of any interest to me subjectively, but, the, but becoming one with you in this communion of love, in this covenant, that's where my treasure lies. In dying, before I die, in the school, of loving another. Uh, the contract, as I understand contract, is a legal binding um, mechanism by which conditions are met on both sides and expectations are satisfied. 
So you scratch mine, I scratch yours. Uh, we have contractual lawyers that read the fine print because uh, you don't sign a contract without um, knowing what you're signing because you want to know the conditions by which you, you will give and which you will take. And if you sign a contract without knowing that, you're an idiot. On, an, on the other hand, this covenant that we get from the Ju Judaic world, the, the covenanting of, the, of, of, the Ju of, the, of God in the, in the Hebrew, the Jewish scriptures, and even the covenanting that we see then in Jesus, who takes that tradition and simply enriches it with his own understanding of it. Covenanting is um, something that you do, not knowing what you're doing when you do it, but you do it anyway because of love. Now, that's the key word, love. That I can covenant in a relationship. See, this is, this is, I think, essential for Christianity. Because for Christianity, at least from the Roman Catholic perspective, no one is saved privately. We are not saved, we are not brought to the fullness of consciousness alone. It's a communal event. So there's su therefore, there's no such thing as an individual Christian, that's an oxymoron. Contradiction in terms. It's always about relationality because the divine is imaged as the relationality, the divine relationality, the Trinity. Therefore, all human consciousness evolves itself to this place where the network of, of love is a profound communion of, of saints, we say. I, I think that the practice of disidentifying has been the process, the journey of, of going through, through that through those practices like meditational practices or through the ritual practices. Because this Eucharist, this Eucharist that we do here is to really to accelerate this kind of communion with Christ, a communion. But a communion, in, in the Roman Catholic theology, we, get, we can have a communion but never lose quite the separate identity in the communion. There's still always. But then there's these mystical traditions that bore, even at Meister Eckhart, some of these mystics are, they border on saying, oh, but the communion is so communing that there is no more I and you. You know, there is, there is, there is this, the, but it's the divine we, which is the Trinity. You know, it's this communion of the we, which is, uh, which is still, there's three, we, we say the mystery of the Trinity, there's, you know, you can't say more than a sentence without becoming a heretical, some, <laughs> some writers have said. But the Trinity is this image of God, which is one God, but three distinct, unique persons in such a profound community that they are one. It's a communion of saints, we say. So a covenant you get into, not knowing what you get into when you're getting into it, but you get into it anyway, and then what are you? Still a fool, but a fool for love. Yeah, I think so. I think that's part of that covenanting, as opposed to the contracting. And most of our relationships are contractual. As long as you give me the special feeling, then I'm with you. Without the special feeling, then forget it. There's a wonderful book on Mary Magdalene and Jesus by a woman named Cynthia Bougeot. And she has a formula that we use at DePaul, because this is another course I teach. I teach a course on esotericism and the occult and Christian mysticism, right? And we use her book. And she has a formula. She has A equals E times K. When that means agape, love. This love that allows us to make these con unconditional covenants. I say yes to you, no matter what, I'll work this out with you. And when you get two people doing that together, then you have the experience of Christ. Because you have two dead people now alive in a communion of saints. And then if that went on to three people and five and ten, and imagine the whole world living no longer for the egoic self, but for the other, the covenant. She says A, agape, equals E, eros. The erotic the passionate that so oftentimes gets tangled with the egoic. Me, my pleasure, my satisfaction, my ecstasies.
the egoic, to take the erotic, but to multiply it by what she calls the K or the kenotic, the kenosis, which is what St. Paul says is what Jesus did. Though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but he emptied himself. The word there is kenosis. He emptied himself becoming the form of a slave, hmm. a servant. If you wish to be the greatest, you become the least. You become a servant as I have washed your feet. Now you wash the feet of each other. And that becomes your greatest erotic pleasure. Your greatest eros is to be of service to others in kenosis. Imagine that. Your greatest eros, your greatest erotic pleasure is to die in service to others. And that, she claims, is what agape is. Because agape is not the, you know, the the special feeling that you get, you know, in this, in the, in the romanticism of our culture. <laughs> you know, which is like an 18th century invention, this romanticism, and you have to have special feelings, and if, you, if the special feelings die, then I don't love you anymore, and, and all of this, you know, that kind of stuff, special feelings. But this is not that at all. That's egoic. But when consciousness expands to, the, to this place of, of non-grasping, then it seems, naturally, we find ourselves in the agapic covenant-making where we find our greatest passion in emptying ourselves for the sake of others and our great joy in washing each other's feet, each other's feet, and outdoing ourselves, St. Paul says, outdoing yourselves in charity, you know, in love, outdoing yourself. First of all, I would like to begin by suggesting that this incarnational principle, which is at the heart of the mystical experience. So you see Bernini trying to capture that in the, the, the ecstasy of Teresa of Avila in that statue there in Rome, Maria della Victoria Church. The first, this, the incarnational principle about this, the body, is that the body does not end with the skin. That there is a consciousness that comes in Christ, this cosmic Christ, this, this spirited consciousness, that that the body, who I am, the body that I am, is, does not end with my skin. But that cultivating this experience, one realizes that we are in communion with all the incarnate physical cosmos, that that is our body. I do an exercise with my students that was given to me by my mentor, David Power, over dinner one night. I was asking him, how do we get to the notion of transubstantiation? And to one of the young seekers that have asked to, to talk to me, uh, he, he asked me, what do I believe I receive when I receive the body of Christ? The body, there's that word again, the body of Christ. He says, what do you believe you receive? And I shared what David Power shared with me. He gave me this as a gift, and I've been using it. I shared it with this friend of mine. And, who is a, kind of a non-believer, but is certainly on the path of expanding consciousness, but it's not institutionalized, you, you know, the spiritual, not religious thing. 
right? But quite spiritual. So what I do is I, I took a loaf of bread from the restaurant table and I said, now look deeply into this loaf of bread and see what you see. Because this will answer your question, what do I believe I receive when I receive the body of Christ? What do you see in this loaf of bread? And this friend said, uh, well, I see um, color. I says, yes, it's color. Look more deeply, what else do you see? And then he says, oh, I see a wheat field. I says, yes. And what else do you see? I see the sunshine, good. And I see water, and I see Lake Michigan, right? And there's the Pacific Ocean. And then you see rain and acid rain because of human pollution that we create is in here. And what else do you see in the bread? There's farmers and there's um, chickens because there's eggs in the bread and then there's worms because there's dirt in the bread. There's soil in the bread. And there's cows because there's milk and eggs and chickens and cows and yes, and then there's, then there's fertilizer in the bread because you have to have fertilizer, natural manure and other kinds there, they're in the bread. What else do you see? And he was stumped and I says, well, there are mouths in the bread. They're, look at all the mouths of hungry people, the hungry children, the people down in now in Houston that are that hungry, starving kids in Africa, they're in here, can you see them? He says, yeah. I says, what else do you see? Come on. I says, there's ovens in the bread. There's fire here. Fire. Not only the sun and the stars, but there's fire. And there's ovens of Auschwitz and Dachau and ovens that destroyed humanity, Jews, because of hatred. That's all in the bread. I says, what else do you see? And so he went on and he talked about grandmother's hands and memories and Thanksgiving dinners and, and then he talked about meals where people didn't talk because they were angry at one another and then he saw in the bread he also saw stardust and, and he saw molecules of dead ancestors and Moses was in the bread because nothing is created or destroyed and the molecules are still around. He says, look, what else do you see? And he came up with all kinds of other things. I says, now. Take all of that, what you see in the bread. Take it all. Because over all of that bread, the church says, this is my body. Over all of that, the ritual says, this is my body. And then, we eat the bread of death, the death of Christ, so that we then can eat the bread of life, and then we are in communion with all of that body. When I did that at the restaurant, at the end, he cried, this young man, he cried, 26-year-old. And I said to myself, this, this is what Paul Ricoeur talks about. The symbol gives rise to thought. Le symbol donne à la, donne à pensée. It, it's, it, I just did this little exercise to explain what I believe I receive in communion. And he wept because he got it at some level. And that is a form of of mystical consciousness that is the very cosmic, but it's encoded, embedded in the Catholic ritual behaviors. And it demands, if you would, a certain amount of, of relinquishment, a surrendering of the egoic thinking that my body is only what's here. And therefore I have to, I have to, uh, because the body has as its fundamental instinct survival. And the, the egoic wants us to keep surviving, hold on. And sometimes, unfortunately, Catholicism has Christianity, and this is what I think these, these young people are reacting against. Christianity has said you have to save your soul. It's all about self-preservation rather, rather than covenantal, agapic washing of feet. All about saving your soul. 
And it just fortified the egoic into a scrupulosity that many of us have. When I was a kid, along with all of this mystical stuff, there was a scrupulosity that grew up inside of me, that God didn't love me, that, there was, that I was like I was a sinner. And, and now the new diagnostic manual, the psychological manual, DM, DSM number five or six, whatever number it is, scrupulosity in religious traditions is considered a mental illness. It's, it's in the family of OCD. Hmm? And I was captured by it because, because unfortunately sometimes in the desire to cause people to become holy, we turned it into an effort done by works and actions rather than by grace. And so this question that you get about the body, it's very simple, that, the, that one, 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 one begins to sense that the Eucharistic experience as it accelerates us into this consciousness, is to say that when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are in communion with Christ, and Christ is the cosmic Lord who fills the universe in all its parts, the multiverses in all its parts, and that we become identified with it. But since survival in the physical form, survival is an instinct so, I, I, I was noticing it <laughs> the other day in Africa. I was in Africa visiting a friend. And you have to get malaria shots. Not malaria shots, malaria pills, right? Because of mosquitoes and mosquitoes. Even in mosquitoes is the desire to survive. There was a mosquito that appeared in my room. And I tried to swat it, and it was fighting me and trying to run away and, and save itself and survive. Even a mosquito has it in his body, in its body. And the desire for survival is a consciousness, once you're aware, it's a fundamental biological consciousness that is, I think, the opponent to dying. And so, in a sense, when we celebrate the Eucharist, we surrender even that fundamental desire to survive, kenosis, with eros. We surrender our desire to survive to God. And in surrendering the desire to survive, now we find a new way of surviving by dying, so that the body the body is the body of Christ. And it's this lovely experience and that is not about my grabbing on in a contract, but loving. And I have to say this with sincerity to both of you. I'm not sure, and again, I'm not sure yet. This is just a speculation that if you can't do this with one person, can you do it with many? Does the, and, and again, I, I, again, friendship therefore becomes paradigmatic here, friendship. Because friendship could include everyone and not just simply, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a different form of relating, friendship. It even has a different purpose than marriage. But I'm wondering, I speculate, if, you, if I am not able to love this way with one other human being, in the cauldron of, of, of uh, my own confrontation with my own survival in relating. I want my thought to be, you know. I want my way, I want my experience in relating. I'm wondering if I can't do this with another human. Can I do this with a group? Just a question. This is why I think when Jesus says in the Gospel, when two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. 
that it's easy for me to do this when there's a whole crowd of people in this building. But when I have to go loggerheads with one other human being, can I relinquish the survival of my own attitudes? And this gets us to the key word, which is metanoia. In the Catholic, the Christian tradition, the word metanoia is what Jesus says at the beginning of his ministry. But even before he, he, he they, they want to know, where do you live? You know, let us talk, talk, talk to us in the Gospel of John. Talk to us, Jesus. And then he says, come and see. Come and see. You know, let me sit down. We'll sit down and talk. But in the other Gospels, he preaches. And John the Baptist does the same thing, and they use the word metanoiain. And literally, that word metanoia, it's connected to the body and to death and to all of this. Metanoia is connected because it's, it means to go beyond the mind. Meta, beyond, and noia, for the noose or the consciousness, go beyond the present state of consciousness. And so this journey of Christian death is a journey of relinquishing the present states of mind. Dying and dying. And I think, for me, at least I've experienced this, in relating with another human being who is on a similar path. Just when I thought I was dead, <laughs> I become a mosquito and try to survive again. <laughs> yes, yes. But it's so tricky because it's all thoughts. It's all, just in the, it's all just in the brain. Those are brain waves. But there's something more deep to consciousness that is able to love. To love. It's because these, these bodies, we can get confused, think that these are just our bodies. But, but if, you, if you say the body is more than the skin, then all of a sudden you're in a new state of consciousness right there. The greatest service one can do is um, when I'm hungry, you give me to eat. When I'm thirsty, you give me to drink. When I'm alone, you visit me, you hold my hand. When I'm in prison, you, you help me out. You know, direct services. I believe that, that if I had answered that question um, at different stages of life, maybe different answers. Or at another stage in my life, I would have said, well, no, it's to get into picket lines. It's to, it's to ask the systemic questions and, and to the greatest service. It can be a, a non-violent resistance to forms of oppression that infiltrate culture because of the vastness of egoic survival consciousness out there. Dog eat dog. Everyone for themselves. So I would have said, maybe it's uh, uh, justice, systemic justice. Or I could have gone with the wonderful Jewish tradition from one of the Jewish teachers where they talk about mitzvahs, mitz mitzvahs, the charity acts, and they go through a list. And the last and the greatest service that one can do is to help one get on their own feet. So rather than feed them food or feed them fish, you teach them to fish. And you actually pay for them to go to a fishing school so that they can learn how to pay, how to fish. So it's a, it's a third kind of one. It's not direct services. It's not systemic justice. It's this mitzvah of, of you know, helping somebody get on their feet so that they can be self-sufficient. That's considered to be a great service. In fact, in that list that's given, I forget who the author is, it was one of the Jewish philosophers who came up with this list, and that's the most beautiful for him, helping another get on their feet. But now I think I might say a different one. I might say that the greatest service is to, to be present to another human being, not to change them, not even to change, not even to desire to change their consciousness, but to kind of get to know them, 
to listen to them. The great service of presence, I think, is a very beautiful one for me now. Uh, not that I don't like helping people get on their feet, I just was doing that with someone else here. But, but that one to me is, um, is, a, is, is, is a wonderful place to be present. Not to change them, but to help them understand that they're more beautiful than they can imagine. You know, that it's, that there's a beauty. Paul Ricoeur comes to mind now, he just entered. He has a great phrase in one of his books on forgiveness. He says, Quoi que tu aies fait, tu vaut mieux que tes actes. No matter what you've done, you're more, you're more valuable than your actions. No matter what we've done, we're worth more. We're worth more than our actions. That's the translation. Tu vaut mieux. You are worth more than your actions. And to sit with someone and to listen, to be present, and to help them to come to listening to themselves and perhaps coming to the awareness that no matter what they've done, they're, more, they're worth more than their actions. They're more beautiful than they can imagine. That, I think, is the greatest service for me right now. The others are important too.